So, so far in this season of Advent, we've been talking about John the Baptist. Uh, we talked about John the Baptist in the wilderness, preaching to the people um, to prepare the way and how to do it before Jesus Christ begins his ministry. Today, we are going to time travel back to the approximately 30 years before all of these things happen. So you heard the name Elizabeth from our reading today, Elizabeth, and she was an older woman who was married to a priest named Zechariah, and they were an older couple who weren't able to have children their whole lives. And then one day Zechariah gets his chance to burn the incense uh, in the temple, and this was an once in a lifetime chance, because while um, this was just given once uh, for each priest to do. So, so he's in the temple while all the worshipers were praying outside, and while he was in the moment, an angel, an angel appears to him and tells him that Elizabeth, his wife, will have a son. At this, at this moment, Zechariah doubts, and asks the angel, how can I be sure about this? How can I be sure about this? Then the angel tells him that because he didn't believe, he will be unable to speak. He returns home, Elizabeth gets pregnant with John, who, who will later become the John the Baptist that we've been talking about, and Zechariah wasn't able to share this great news with anybody since he wasn't able to speak for nine months. Can you believe that? He wasn't able to speak for nine months. Perhaps this was uh, God's way of saying too much words, too much noise, too much thinking. It's amazing how so many times, I think we, we can all agree on this, uh, so many times it is actually in the silence when we experience God's presence. So that was a very brief story of Elizabeth's pregnancy. Now six months later, six months later, the same angel, angel Gabriel, God sent to Zechariah, shows up to a young woman whose name was Mary, who was pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, but not yet married. The angel tells her that she will have a baby, and that she's going to name him Jesus. And this baby will do all these great things. And like Zechariah, but slightly in a different tone, she questions the angel. How will this be? since I am a virgin. The angel explained that the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit will make this possible. Even your cousin Elizabeth is going to have a child in her old age, for nothing is impossible with God. That was the angel's response. So comparing these two stories, I wasn't sure if the angel was all fair with Zechariah and Mary. Because in reality, they both questioned, because to both of them, the idea of having a baby was impossible. And Zechariah was not able to speak because, of, because he doubted, and Mary, who also doubted, wasn't punished in any sense. But the point here is not about God playing favoritism or not. The point here is that we all doubt. We all doubt. And that's what being human, constantly living into the uncertainty, is all about. The important question there is this. What do we do with that doubt? It's not about having a doubt that is a problem, but it is what do we do with that doubt? How do you respond to it? Do you still believe or not? When Mary was told that uh, by the Holy Spirit 
this will be possible, this is how Mary responds. I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. That's Mary's response. She had questions, or a doubt if you may, like Zechariah and like all of us. But she believed. And she really believed. And this faith leads into the story we read today. When Mary found out that she was pregnant, she was probably thinking, who can I talk, talk to about this, right? And she thought of Elizabeth. And Mary got ready and hurries to her. And Elizabeth gave this blessing in verse 45 we read today, and it talks about Mary's faith. This is what Elizabeth says. Blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be blessed. Blessed is she who has believed. And to this, Mary said some words, beautiful words, which is often called magnificent. Magnificent. Because that is the first word of the song in Latin. Like some people call the Lord's Prayer our Father, right? Because those are the first words. So it's the same idea, magnificent. And this song is one of the most famous songs in Christianity. And meanwhile, words that were hard, hard to be dealt with. So when Martin Luther, the reformer, translated the Bible into German, he left the Magnificat in Latin because the German princes didn't cope well with the idea of the mind being in humble state. They didn't like it. So it wasn't the most comfortable piece throughout the Christian history. But when we go to the essence of this song, I think, I believe this is all about pure joy. Pure joy. For those of you on social media, sometimes, I don't know about you, but there are those posts of your friends that you feel like you need something more than the typical like button, right, that you use for everything else, pretty much. For example, recently, uh, special friends of mine uh, they're special because they were the first couple that I married. Announced that they were expecting a new baby next year. And that itself was a super exciting news, but it wasn't just a baby, but they are expecting a twin. And when I saw that the level of joy in me was, was so beyond, like, because I knew it wasn't easy for them to get pregnant for a while. It took them a while to succeed. And when I think about the amount of emotional battle they've been through for so many years, you could imagine how much joy was there for me. If I could, I would have clicked on the like button like millions, millions of times. So that kind of joy, that kind of joy, a kind that transcends the worries about being awkward after all these years, a kind that transcends the worries about if someone's post is in good representation of what I believe about something, you know, all of that. I remember the experience of when our first baby was born, Noah was born. The feeling which no words can possibly describe. When your idea, your theology, your idea of life is no longer an idea, right? There's no shame in your tears. There's no shame in your dances. There's no shame in your singing. You just can't wait to share that news with the entire world. You don't care. You just want to share it. That's the attitude we should have when we read Mary's song. And in this song that Mary sings, there was everything that she had dreamt. There was everything that the prophets of ancient Israel dreamt. The dream that one day all that the prophets 
had said would come true. One day Israel's God would bless all nations. But for that to happen, the powers that kept the world in slavery had to be toppled. God would have to win a victory over the bullies, the power brokers, the forces of evil. And Mary and Elizabeth, like other Jews of their time, searched scriptures in the ancient songs and the words of the prophets which spoke of God's mercy, hope, God's fulfillment, God's reversal, revolution, victory over evil, and of God coming to the rescue at last. All of that, all of that poured into this one piece of song. We shouldn't forget that this is a scene from the marginalized of the marginalized. Just imagine two pregnant women. One who was elderly with a husband who lost his ability to speak. The other an unmarried young woman holding hand together in a house in a country family, singing the song of the prophets. And the way that Mary does this with with tremendous amount of confidence. She sings about something that will be happening in the future as if it has already happened in the past. She makes it sound like it's already a done deal. And the in interesting piece about this song is that there is no mention about me in this famous song. There is no mention about Jesus. And that indicates that Mary's role is not just a humble mother, but she is a prophet of God. And she is an angel, agent of God, who bears the good news itself in herself. There was a story uh, that came across to me that I wanted to share with you, and it's about a, a story of a Lutheran pastor. Um, a Lutheran pastor, one of eight children who lived in Austria, as a child during the Nazi occupation, tells this story. It was Christmas Eve, and his father was away at the war. So his mother gathered the children, eight children around her, to read about Mary giving birth to Jesus. As she did, they could hear soldiers outside their windows, patrolling the curfew and enforcing the orders forbidding religious celebrations. The family was very quiet. When the mother finished reading the story, the youngest sister asked, Mama, aren't we going to sing? With only a moment's hesitation, his mother answered, Of course we are going to sing. Tonight we celebrate the coming of the Christ child into our world. So she gathered the children about the piano, and they sang, Joy to the world, joy to the world. Hearing footsteps from the stairway, the mother didn't stop, but launched, launched to the next song, Heart the Herald Angels Sing. As the soldiers appeared at their door, to their great surprise and delight, the soldiers didn't arrest them. Instead, they all sang together. So today we ask ourselves, how about us? Can they hear us singing? Whether with our voices or our actions, we can sing a song that magnifies and Mary is inviting us to sing the Magnificat in our own ways. But let's face it, having joy, joy is not always easy. It's not always easy. Being joyful, as much as the season expects us to be, is not always natural. 
Many times our stress might seem bigger and more real than this whole singing a song that magnifies God. But as Henry Nowen says, he says, joy does not simply happen to us. We have to choose joy and keep choosing it every day. Yes, joy might have been so obvious when you heard that news about a baby of someone you so much so uh, care so much about. Or there is a new baby born into your family. During those times, joy is obvious. But most of the times in our lives, the true joy comes with only intentionality. A true joy is the one you choose to have even when something breaks down your car, your house, or you don't have enough to pay your next bill. A true joy is the one that you choose to have when your firstborn is now five years old and jumps on you and wakes you up at 5.30 a.m. <laughs> a true joy is the one that you choose to have in a divisive and isolating nature of that our social media might cultivate. A true joy is the one that you choose to have. And we don't know what the, what the exact story of Mary was, but for whatever reason, she did not have a trusting parent who she could share the news with. Perhaps, perhaps, like Mary, the true joy in life and the confidence to sing this beautiful song doesn't come from what she didn't have. But it was in the Auntie Beth that she had. So I pray that in this season we call, we can all join, join Mary by intentionally choosing joy every day by looking around near us and appreciating all the things that God has given us. So thanks be to God. Amen.